Hello, fellow Movie Crusaders, and welcome to another episode of the Weekend Crusaders. My name is Sean Wasserkrieg. With me, as always, is Brian Michaels as we go over five more movies that have come out during the weekend of July 16th through the 18th. Am I right on that? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, don't look back, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. Um, yeah, like like we said last week, uh, this is the week that really felt like 4th of July weekend for me. I feel like these movies were definitely more 4th of July-esque kind of films. Um, to, for me, outside of uh, one particular film, these are four favorites of mine. I was really excited to go back and rewatch four. Actually, I was, re- I was excited to go back and rewatch all five. Four of them I had very great experiences with. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts on the uh, movies that we t- we're talking about today? Uh, I was excited to watch three of them that I already knew I loved. It was happy to revisit. Uh, one I had never seen, so I was curious to see that one. And the other one, I, I was not excited to see again. Because, yeah. Well, what would be July without Will Smith? I mean, he is Mr. July. If we were if we were talking about what actors own a month, Will Smith is July. Would you agree? Uh, there was a time, not so much these days, but for the, for a good chunk of time, he was Mr. July. Yeah. He was. He was. Uh, and so naturally, we've got two Will Smith uh, movies on on the sh- show tonight, uh, and they're both favorites of Brian Michaels and I. As we are going to start with Brian's pick, and that is the 2004 sci-fi action film *I Robot*. *I Robot* came out July 16, 2004. Had a budget of 120 million dollars. Had a weekend opening of 52.17 million. It was number one its opening weekend. It's only week at number one. And it finished box office of 353 million, 144.8 million domestic and 208.33 million international. Uh, Now, Brian, since this is your first pick, why don't you start us off with iRobot? So uh, iRobot, based on, I believe it was Isaac Asimov, I think, uh, novel, Um, but it takes place in 2035 in Chicago which I'm sorry, even if this is, you know, 14 years of the future, Chicago will never look this clean. I don't care what you say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I bet their play is not happening. Um, so, uh, but basically uh, robots have become just commonplace everywhere. Like uh, robots are everywhere. They, 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 you know, act as people's, you know, assistants and servants. They, they run, you know, technology, they run traffic, they run, they're everywhere. They deliver um, packages, which means you would probably be without a job. <laughs> right. Uh, and they have what they call their, the, the, the three uh, laws. The three laws uh, basically say that uh, a robot cannot harm a human. Uh, it cannot uh, disobey a human unless it violates, unless that violates the first law. And it must protect itself unless it violates the first two laws. It's essentially what it is. I'm paraphrasing. Um, basically, they have this thing. So robots have never committed a crime. Um, but Will Smith is this cop who uh, he has a whole backstory that go into it, why he doesn't trust uh, robots. And and so he's always very suspicious. He always you know, thinks they're committing crimes, even though they've never been known to commit a crime. Uh, and so uh, I'm blanking on his name all of a sudden. James Cromwell. Thank you. Oh, James Cromwell. Cromwell. <laughs> yeah, he's the head of the company that makes these robots, essentially. Uh, he kills himself. And this message goes out to Will Smith. And he doesn't know why he called him. Uh, but this message out to him, and he's basically put on the case to try and solve what what has happened here. Uh, that's the basic premise of the movie in a nutshell. Uh, this is a movie that it's directed by Alex Proyas, who best known for The Crow, also Dark City. If you haven't seen that one, I would highly recommend Dark City. Um, but he's also made some wonderful movies like Gods of Egypt and and Knowing, which while it has its moments, is, is not a good movie either. Uh, so he's kind of hit and miss as a director. I think this movie, though, I think it... It looks really good. I mean, they're, they're, not all the CGI is kind of held up. I mean, this is what seventeen years ago. I think they like yeah. the CGI of like the robots and things is excellent. I think some of the things like a lot of the background stuff is, doesn't quite hold up, but some of the uh, action scenes with like the driving and things like that. But I mean, just to overlook that on a technical level, I think that it's a movie that's uh, the action set pieces. I think are very well done. My only complaint about the movie is that it seems like at times it gets a little repetitive. It's like Will Smith goes somewhere, uh, some robot entity oh, attacks him he moves on to the next place and then some robot entity attacks him he Moves on to the next place it's like you know okay eventually I, even his boss has got to believe him at some point <laughs> but of course they don't until they attack them uh but i think will smith is is in full will smith mode i mean complete with all his classic catchphrases like oh hell no and all that kind of stuff it's like he it's like they make sure they write all of his catchphrases into the script so this is classic july will smith 
action star. And it just really works for me. I think it, the, the movie really rests on his shoulders and his performance. And I think he does a very good job. Um, the main other human role, I guess, would be Bridget Moynihan, uh, who she kind of, she kind of had a short lived career. I mean, I know, she doesn't need to. I mean, she's well, Tom Brady's baby mama. So she can live off that for the rest of her life if she wants dude, to. Dude, she's been on like Blue Bloods for like the last like 12 years. Oh, see, I don't watch TV. Yeah, she's, she's, she's like a staple on the so She's got a okay, theatrical <laughs> career. She made, some, she made some good movies. I mean, I liked some of All Fears. I liked Coyote Ugly. I liked some other stuff she's done. Uh, but this, So this is one that she put out during that time. Alan Tudyk apparently doing a dry run for K2SO in Rogue One because here he, he is the voice of... of uh, Sunny. Sunny, the, kind of the main robot in this movie. Um, but yeah, this is just a movie that I think that I, I was going to say it's kind of underrated, but actually the more I look at it, I think most people at least liked it. Not everybody like loved it as much as some of us do. And and to me, I don't know if I enjoyed it as much as I did like when I first saw it, but I still very much enjoy this. And I think it's a well-made movie. I This is one of those movies, I remember, I remember when it was coming out, that mm -hmm. when I saw the trailers and stuff like that, I was like, this just looks like Will Smith in autopilot. Like, oh, it's July. We got to have a Will Smith movie. Here it is. Because it just didn't, I don't know, something didn't feel, it didn't feel like a Will Smith movie. It just kind of felt almost like a lazy attempt at just throwing a, a July movie out there because it's Will. Um, but once you get into the actual film and you start to kind of see the world building and everything, all that kind of stuff, it, it has this, this kind of charm. Because like I said, Will Smith, he's basically prejudiced towards robots in the film, which based off of his backstory, which I actually really, really like that backstory. Once we actually yeah. got it, I was like, ooh, okay, I, I see I see your point now. I really like where that went. Also, great little performance from Will in that moment when he's talking about that backstory. I, that's peak, like, love that moment for Will Smith. That's probably my favorite scene of his in the movie. Um, but, you know, he's got his wise cracking humor that we see and everything else. And, um, you know, he, we obviously, just like Tom Cruise, Will Smith's got to run. Uh, a good length in the film at some point, um, but like I said, it's got its charm. Yeah, uh, you, know, you got you got Will Smith being Will Smith. Alan Tudyk as Sonny, I think, works really well because this was still at the time when Tudyk was Firefly guy. He wasn't really. Yeah, he wasn't because he since then has done tons of voiceover work. Yeah, so like he wasn't a relative big name unless you yeah. would have watched Serenity or well, not Serenity, but Firefly. You really didn't know Alan Tudyk yet, but. Going back and seeing this, like you're like, this is this is like little, you know, like real, real, like you said, his like introduction level to doing voice work and everything like that. Um, Shia LaBeouf has like three, four scenes in the movie. Okay. He's completely, utterly wasted. But this is like pre like Transformer Shia LaBeouf, where he's still like, I think this might have been like one of his very first roles before like after like even Stevens like this and Constantine. Mm -hmm. So he's like just kind of like. Is that Shia LaBeouf? <laughs> like, yeah, I remember this and Constantine came out, what, like a year apart? I think Constantine yeah. five, if I recall correctly. And he kind of played very similar roles, actually, in both basically, of them. Except in, this one, he, except in this one, he's really bad at swearing. Yeah, to a T, he's basically playing the same role where he's like, hey, I'm not on the Disney Channel anymore. I can cuss. That's basically what Shia LaBeouf is in this film. Uh, Bridget Moynihan, I think, is does a solid job of kind of playing everything very, very dry. But then as the story starts to unfold, develops more into an actual character. Uh, Cromwell, he's James Cromwell. He's at the most bare bones Cromwell we get, which frankly, mm -hmm. that's kind of what we get it with him in most movies now, is he kind of is this guy, he gets he dies, <laughs> and we move on. But uh, I think the action works really well in the story. Uh, Shia McBride, that's another one. I love Shia McBride. Shia, um, my only problem is, I have one problem with Shia McBride, is that Shia McBride is great in comedic roles. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, nobody's seen this movie with me. Let's go to prison. He's great in that. Uh, if you've seen The Frighteners, of course, he's great in that. And yes. So in this, I mean, he does a great job in here. He's kind of like the, the captain who's like, oh, you're always messing up, you know, the typical captain in these action movies. But so he's pretty much serious through this whole movie. So I, I really wish they would have let him be a little more comedic, but it is what it is. I'm, I guarantee you, there's probably some extra scenes of his on the cutting room floor <laughs> that just didn't make it to the final cut. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this really has to fall on the ability for Will Smith to play off of the CG of, of Sonny, which I think he does really well. Um, the action sequences, I, I really liked. And for, like how you said, like, oh, everything keeps malfunctioning and stuff on Will Smith and no one seems to figure it out. Well, it's because they keep covering all their bases. 
on him. Like literally the the big uh, big scene in the uh, the tunnel, uh, like everything gets cleaned up before the police show up. That's that's the shocking part is that it took the police that long. <laughs> to get there, but in, in 2021 up. Chicago, there's cameras at every street corner. There's no cameras in this tunnel. I mean, come on. I mean, just because 2021 has that doesn't mean that in 2004 they thought, oh, everything's gonna be like. Because honestly, is cell phones really a big deal in this movie? I don't think they are. I, I, you know, I don't recall. I'm sure they communicated somehow. I'm just not remembering yeah. it. But they, they were too busy obsessing over, you know. 20th century Converse and music. Yeah, Converse shoes and JVC, uh, you know, like stereo yeah. stuff. <laughs> but um, and I, I will say this right now. There is one thing that always sticks out to me. I have no idea why, but the brown sugar in this movie. <laughs> like when Will gets the coffee and he pours like brown sugar at brown, like because the sugar's brown. And it's like, I don't, best looking brown sugar I've ever seen. Let's just put it that way. That's always stuck out to me for some weird reason. Maybe it's one if you could borrow some brown sugar. Brown sugar, which is connected to another movie we're going to be talking about later. Um, but yeah, I it's one of those Will Smith movies that I think came off as more of a surprise because I don't think anyone went in with super high expectations of, mm-hmm. of iRobot because like I say it looked like kind of just like a Will's just making a movie for, for July. You know, we're going to go see it. But then I think for the most part, everyone was really surprised and liked what they saw. It's not going to be up there with the best of Will Smith. I, I actually really like it, so it would be up there for me. But I think for the most part, unlike, let's say, Hancock, where it was, oh, cool, let's, we're going to see Will Smith do this, and then the end was kind of eh. I think I, Robot is a movie that gets stronger as the film goes and has a – a nice message by the end of the film, especially for, for Sonny. Uh, and it's just it's just a solid sci-fi Will Smith movie all around. I, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. It was one I hadn't seen in quite a while, so it was good to go back and, re- and uh, basically uh, recheck this one out. Yeah, it's it, it been quite a while for me. So, I, I, I mean, it wasn't like – I'm not going to say it was like the first time watching it because I remember most of the movie, but there were things in it that I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot all about that. What, what, what's funny is throughout this whole week, I kept thinking – that the revisited was your pick and I robot was the revisited because I was like, oh Brian wouldn't have picked this. I was like, oh no, this is Brian's movie. Okay. <laughs> I'd have been okay with either one of them. Exactly, exactly. But um I robot, is it on anything? Uh it is currently available on Amazon Prime as well as 2B TV if you don't have Prime. You can watch on there with ads. Let's put it this way. If you don't have Amazon Prime, I doubt you've got 2B TV. So well no 2B TV is free for anyway. It's one of those free with ads channels. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, anyway, if you guys have, if you guys are looking for a Will Smith film and you're tired of watching, you know, the same old Will Smith movies over and over again, check out iRobot. It's probably one that may have fell through the cracks or maybe one you haven't revisited just as long. Uh, you will not be disappointed. Um, going now to our stinker film. Now, this is one I, I think we made the right choice because we were going to go with the other film, and I think we made the right choice on this. Do you agree? I, I- I don't remember what the other film was, but we definitely were right. It was this Arthur. Sticker. It was Arthur. We were going to do Arthur or this. That one would have been more painful to sit through, actually. But this is, they're both bad, but this was definitely a stinker. Yeah. Um, this is from a franchise that is near and dear to my heart. At least the first film is. Uh, it's The first film of this franchise is one of my favorite films of all time, something that I have watched more times than I can count. And what's sad is that this one is probably the one I've watched the second most because of where it went, you know, my age, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like one of those things was like where, um, like for instance, Die Hard, like not now, but since Die Hard, since it's behind your head, for me growing up, Die Hard with a Vengeance was probably the one I saw the most because at my age, that was right around that time frame. Um, whereas Die Hard obviously is the best. Die Hard Avengers is the one that I usually get to see. For me, the first film, obviously, I watched a ton of, but this one was probably the one I watched the second most. Uh, so I didn't really remember hating it. I actually thought, I was like, oh, I don't think it's that bad. Like, I know it's not as good, but it's not as bad. But we decided to give it a, a rewatch. It had been, I think, since Brian, it's been since it came out in theaters. I saw this movie in the theaters in 1987. Yeah. So I yeah. was like 14 years least, old. It had been at least 10 plus years probably since I've seen it personally. But we are talking about the fourth film 
in the Jaws franchise, which is very weird to call Jaws a franchise. It just doesn't feel like a franchise. But we were talking about Jaws the Revenge. Uh, Jaws the Revenge came out July 17th, 1987, had a budget of $23 million, had a weekend opening of $7.15 million. It was number three its opening weekend behind RoboCop in its first week, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves re-release in its first week, had a finished box office of $51.88 million, 20.76 million domestic and 31.11 million international. Talk about a, a good weekend right there. You got RoboCop, a Jaws film, and then a re release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. That's actually a pretty packed weekend right there. Um, yeah, this film, there's a lot that you can attack <laughs> about this movie. Yeah. Um, ideology of Great White Sharks is definitely in question in this film. Um, great white sharks probably don't go to New Jersey in Christmas time because it's uh, probably too cold, you know, for granted. Then they also don't like warm water, so they wouldn't go to the Bahamas. But most importantly, sharks don't have a psychological link to a woman who has never been involved with the sharks in any of these films or have a vendetta against a family. Um, let alone one that didn't, that probably was like not even born <laughs> when, when uh, the first film came out. Um, Jaws of Revenge is utterly ridiculous in every sense of the word. Uh, Brian, what are your thoughts on Jaws of Revenge? So the whole thing about Jaws, I mean, the, 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 the tagline for it was this time it's personal. And the whole thing about that is they're trying to make it like, oh, well, guess what? It's personal for the shark but it's also personal for her. Both of them have these vendettas because I mean, with her, you know, this, I, it's been terrorizing these, these sharks, not this shark, whole different thing has been terrorizing her family for, for years. Um, it's caused death of family members, things like that. And then for the shark, I don't know. Is it supposed to be related to the other sharks? See, that's the thing too. It only outside of this, the, the, the initial start of this film, it had never killed anyone in, in their family. I mean, Roy Schneider's character had a heart attack. I doubt it was Great White Shark related. And yeah. then the two sons, for at the start of the film, were both alive. So it terrorized, yes, but definitely has not killed anyone. And, until and, and may, I mean, it's, it's just far-fetched enough as is. But, okay, maybe it, it, it killed her one kid and then later on could come after her or something. But, no, it it – this happens up in where are they in they're, they're in Amityville, New Jersey, New That's Jersey. Right. And yeah. then she takes a vacation down in like the Bahamas. And apparently the same shark swims down to the Bahamas. Well, tracks down. Not, not only does it, not only does it have vendetta, it knows who her son's daughter is and goes to attack that person on a banana boat. It's like, well, I mean, let's put it this way. Maybe maybe it was like Finding Nemo. It found a channel thing to get it down there faster. <laughs> no. It's not even a matter of timing, though. I don't, I don't care how long it took him to get here's there. The, the fact that it would go down there. Like, it knows she took a trip to the Bahamas. <laughs> here's the other thing, too, the ridiculous part of it at the beginning of the film, is that apparently the shark stages something to draw the Brody out into the water. Could have been anyone. Doesn't have you just common, you know, like circumstance that it's a Brody that comes up to the water, but it sticks it like apparently according to, I mean, if, if we're thinking logically with this film, this shark set a trap by putting a piece of wood up against a, a buoy. And then thus the Brody comes out and be, and Brody being stupid, reaching out to grab this thing. He's just lying there and wait, like, Oh, I'm going to get this guy. And then, and then bites his arm off granted. But then Brody, just leans near the edge of the boat and lets the shark, which which we both described this as uh, piranha esque attacking by the camera shots. Like the, the the main problem with Jaws, the revenge, which there's a lot of problems, but is that it didn't feel like a Jaws film. The the iconic soundtrack, yes, it does pop up, you know, in in the opening credits and then like three fourths of the way film uh, through the film, but it's just that. Even the attack uh, of Jaws doesn't – it's more – I don't want to say comical, but it's just like like over the top, not even like cheesy, but just bad. 
you know, well, like, there's, oh, a, there's two problems. Like one, yeah. they, they, they did two things. Either one, they went to like stock footage of sharks, which is like it was so funny you couldn't even tell what's going on. Which I said looks like two, yeah. Like or rock. two, they tried to use the uh, mechanical shark, which you tell me well, is the whole, same that's one. A whole, that's a whole other. That's a whole other thing. We'll get into that later. But yeah, but, but yeah, so it just made things look more comical because you're like you're not buying into any attacks. But but yeah, for the for the shark to set up a trap for one of the Brodies then make its way down to the Bahamas and then pinpoint that, oh, this little girl is uh, is the daughter of another Brody. I must attack her. Like, once again, circumstance. Like, really, that shark had to have gotten down to the Bahamas. Know that that was a Brody. And then... And then because also, this time it's personal for reasons unknown. And then also, when um, uh, Mario Van Peebles is in the water, he, he, he just swims by him, doesn't mess with him, just like... Oh, there's a great white shark down here, and the shark's just in like, "What's up, bro? I ain't gonna eat you today." But as soon as Michael gets in the water, all fucking bets are off, man. This shark's going for his ass. <laughs> it's just like, it's 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 ridiculous. And then we'll we'll go ahead and talk about Bruce, uh, Bruce the shark, the mechanical shark, which iconically, the shark doesn't work barely at all, which is why we got what we got in Jaws one, where. It was more not seeing the shark and the they were fear. forced to be more creative, yeah. Of course, more creative and, and the fear of it. Now in two and three, three they were doing a whole three D deal and all that kind of stuff. So they were using different kind of special effects and stuff like that. In this film, they are all about using Bruce's shark to its fullest. Here's the problem: Bruce's shark is in bad shape. It's it's in bad shape. There are times in the film its upper lip you can see is too separated from the gums because the robot is really starting to kind of fall apart. There's one point where the shark is chasing Michael in the water and it literally looks like the shark is on the, like is on a stick and they're just doing this, like having to go like, like this at him. It's, and then, and then when it attacks somehow it defies gravity and stays above water like this. Look, it's shark week. We have seen plenty of videos of sharks leaping out of the water, like a dolphin and they naturally have to come down and stuff like that. It's fantastic to watch. If you guys have never seen it, definitely check out great white sharks leaping out of the water. But this jaws, is like Michael Jordan, where it can shoot out of the water, stay elevated like this, and then hold it, and then come down. It's like someone you can't even dolphin. pretend. I mean, the the difference between dolphins and sharks. A dolphin, yes, can sit up and, and keep its tail flapping and stay halfway above water. Like sharks can't do that. Sharks need to keep like swimming. That. Yeah, yeah dolphins tails like this, so it can it can use that to to kind of. Yeah, the shark, shark can do that. He's got to keep moving. He's not going to yeah. hang there in the water. Not to mention that the shark literally pulls a Jason and Mike Myers at one point because we're literally watching them go through like this broken down boat, and the shark is like literally trying. I'm like I'm like in theory, oh, this shark's dead. The shark's too big to turn around. It's going to get trapped, and it's not going to be able to swim. It's going to die. And then Michael literally goes up a floor, like through a little hole, and then the shark's right on his ass. I'm like, how the fuck did the shark get there? Like there's there's no logical way for the shark to have gotten there unless it's you know Jason Mike Myers kind of kind of situation where the killer just magically transports to a different part of an area, but and then also that the shark growls. Um, apparently, sharks are scared of yes, fluorescent growling and yeah. a humming, and it causes them to growl like a tiger. <laughs> and then and then we also, it's it was one of those things where clearly this movie. It was, it's 90 minutes, like to the dot. It is 90 minutes. And they have to use stock footage of Jaws 1 to fill in the time. And also just some of the most unnecessary it's mundane scenes dialogue. that have nothing to do with the plot of the movie. It's like, let's watch the day in the life of these people for no reason. Like there's literally a moment where Michael is coming home to see his mom after Sean's death. And we see Michael going out to his mom you know what, go ahead and switch the scene to that because that's actually a good moment. That could be a good moment. But no, we have to listen to his daughter talking to, what, the neighbors or something, talking about nothing, really, and 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 missing that, that introduction. Well, way outside the window, you just see him walking. In exactly. Talking. Or watching, there's just so many times where they just really wanted the little girl to have lines in the film, and they just left the, like, the camp, like the mic on, in like a room and the camera left the room to follow other characters, but we're still listening to the little girl talk to 
whoever the fuck she's talking to in the other room. And it's the just, adults who are all sick of her shit, by the way. They're like, yeah, we know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, even even Michael Caine is just like, shut the fuck up, kid. <laughs> you know, it's like when she's on the boat or not the boat, she's on the plane, and she's just like bothering him while he's flying the plane. You can just tell Michael Caine's like, yeah, I'm, I'm through with this kid. Like, push her in the back. But it's it's just every there's so much dialogue. That is just unnecessary. And I, I I get all movies have unnecessary dialogue, but it is like a focal point of unnecessary dialogue. To, to like there was like the one point where um Michael and Van Peebles are uh which Van Peebles has a horrific Jamaican accent in this film. It is bad yeah. how bad the Jamaican accent is in this film. But they're they're dealing with the shark on the boat, and somehow um Mrs. Brody feels it. <laughs> And she like she's like what like a festival like a part like a parade thing. They have a psychic link apparently. Not exactly. Yet. There's a psychic link. She knows something's something's happened, even though nothing's happened except for Michael being scared by the shark. And then she decides, I'm just gonna dance, and starts. And it's just it's an awkward scene. And Michael, yeah. like, and they're in the middle of this carnival or something. She's talking about like how things are horrible, but they're like, oh, let's just dance anyway. Just it's so it's and and Lorraine was is a Lorraine Gray. Lorraine Gray. Yeah, she's a horrible actress. Oh my god. No, L- Lorraine Gary. Sorry, Lorraine Gary. Horrible. I, no, I, I didn't honestly realize it was the same actress that had been in this from the first one. Because uh, yeah. I haven't, I've seen the first Jaws several times, but not well, as attached to it as Sean is. I didn't realize it was the same woman. I oh, she's a horrible actress. Well, it's, it's the thing is that I, I think it's because we just never really focused on her in in one and two because she's not in three because it's all about you know. Uh, Roy Schneider, and we're not we're not focusing on her. She's she's there, but she gets like a few lines here and there. Enough, not enough to the point to be damaging. But like her crying in this is so god awful, and like it's almost like you're in pain. Like they had to stab her in the thigh to get a a, a cry out of yeah, her. No, because that would have been real crying. This was just the worst exactly. thing crying. It's so it's so bad, and it's just so random when she does. Which I get it, like. Your morning guilt hits you at certain times. You don't suspect it, but it's just so comically bad. And Michael Caine is just kind of there. He's fine, but he's, he's, like, he's, he's, like, he's, like, a, he's like a playboy pilot kind of guy. But it's like never in this film do you actually feel like he's a playboy. It's just it's except for the whole time that her son's like, "What are you doing with my mother?" Like, yeah, ver dialogue. He's a playboy. We never see. He sees me a straight up guy the entire film, yeah. and then. The inevitable end of the film. The ending. The ending of the film. Once again, we get to the part where we find out that apparently, I'm going to call it Jaws, is is affected by fluorescent lighting and and buzz. Strobe lighting, yeah. Thing. yeah. And it goes, oh! <laughs> I love that every time. Like I, I told Brad, I go, look, I go, the shark, this is obviously hurting the shark. Does he go underwater where it doesn't affect him? No, he stays up above the water to go, ah, and growl. And then he charges the boat, and because which, by the way, as soon as he showed the boat, I said, "Hey, is this how it's going to end?" Sean's like, eh. "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's going to get stabbed by the front of the boat." But then it's it's almost like they couldn't even do that right because oh they had to tie in the way the shark dies in the first film, which is Roy Schneider going, "You know, you son of a bitch," shooting, and which in the first film he's got an oxygen tank in his mouth, it explodes, the shark blows up. This shark gets stabbed with with the um what do you, what do you want to call it the uh the bow whatever the pole the bow, yeah the, 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 yeah. yeah gets stabbed like a joust gets yeah. stabbed but it then it, it explodes that that's not the way shark the, the, the moment before it does they do that weird quick flashback to Roy Shadow, which has nothing to do with anything <laughs> by the way it's like that quick that quick of the go back to him and then it stabs him and he decided boom. Yeah. There's no reason. I mean, I guess he just had really bad gas. I don't know because there's no explanation. He literally ran and go, literally explodes on impact. Up? Did he just blow up? Like, he just, like, I, why did he blow up? Like, did he eat something prior? Like, because we didn't see it. And nope. then Mario Van Peebles, who got ripped apart. Yeah, he should have been in pieces. Is just like hanging out over here going, oh, I'm okay, man. Everything good, bro. And I was like, no, you're dead. And if Jonas you're not like dead. Dark if you're not dead, there are other sharks eating your ass because you're bleeding all over the water. 
But you're good, bro. No, you're not. You're dead, Mario Van Peebles. Like it's we, just like, it's not like it's not like he was in the water and he got pulled over under we didn't see him again. We saw him getting chomped on. He got chomped and then like, dragged underwater. Yeah. He got chomped and dragged. You're gonna drown and bleed out. And then he somehow rises to the surface. It is like 50 feet to the left. All good, no. <laughs> no. 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 Which effectively this movie killed the franchise, obviously. Right. But, so. I mean, it made its money back. It doubled its budget, but still, it's we never saw another Jaws movie again. Now, granted, we've seen a ton of shark films, and I think out of maybe two, there have only been like maybe two good shark movies since the Jaws franchise has closed. Uh, I mean, that's debatable, but to me, there's only been two good ones. Um, but uh, yeah, Jaws of Revenge. I remember this fondly more as a kid, but it is it is bad. It is really really bad. Yeah, that was it was the only one I got to see in theaters. And I remember saying, "Hey, I'm gonna go see Jaws movie in theaters," and then I watched it, and I was just like, "Yeah, that wasn't good." And I was like, "Just like Brian has so, been so far removed from the Jaws franchise, he didn't realize that Dennis Quaid in three was the same character in this." I have, I, I, I'm honestly not sure I've ever seen Jaws two. Jaws three, I have not seen in at least 10, 20 years at this point. So I barely remember anything about it. I remember like the setting of it, but I don't remember anything about the characters. So yeah, I had no idea Dennis Quaid was supposed to be the same character. And and in this one, you know, you have uh, uh, Army Hammer with a perm, it looks like to me. Oh, so. no, we had like, what was it, like four different actors who came up with it? <laughs> looks like <laughs> Army Hammer, he looked like Michael Fassbender, he looked like Kevin Klein. And then yeah. oh, there was one more, there was one more. I can't remember yeah. who it was. But yeah, it was just, it, Jaws 3 is a bad rep because of the 3D. If you take the 3D aspect out of it, it's actually... It's not terrible. It's a decent film. Um, and I, I, like you, I barely remember Jaws 2. I really don't remember Jaws 2 at all. And that's for someone who loves the Jaws franchise. I barely remember 2 at all. Um, but yeah, uh, the, all the Jawses are on uh, Peacock. Peacock. Peacock right now, yes. Um, so feel free to watch the first one. Maybe watch the second one. Check out Jaws 3 because I think it's a, not a bad film outside of the 3D. And completely fucking avoid Jaws the Revenge. Pretend it didn't exist because that's what I'm going to try to do the rest of my life is pretend that this movie did not exist. Uh, one more bit of uh, trivia just when I was doing my research, you know, can I list the names that we're tracking of who's in all the movies you watch? Yeah. Uh, Eldon Henson, of all people, is listed as additional voices in this movie. So I'm assuming he's just like, you know, was a when they needed to record Screaming Kids for the Beach or something. Oh, so, yeah, so he had to have been like, five maybe when this movie came out something like that i mean he's i mean he's yeah i mean because i was actually the mighty ducks was like five years later yeah so he, i mean so he was just a little kid but yeah but, but anyway so he gets a, he's gonna get a mark for this one i had no uh, idea it's not, it's not a good mark it's a stinker <laughs> pick so oh yeah it's gonna be a stinker pick oh no yeah, Sorry, it's, like, it's, not, it's not a pick we want him to be in <laughs> but uh Anyway, um, like I said, avoid this one at all costs. Rewatch re the other three films, obviously, especially the first one because it's an all-time classic. Um, uh, so next up for our revisited, this is a film that uh, Brian and Michaels and I both said last week that we keep forgetting about this movie, but we both love this film. Um, and this is a film that, uh, I, honestly, I love this movie. I really do. And I forgot all about it. So rewatching it this week, I was like, man, I like this movie so much. And we are talking about the swashbuckling action film, The Mask of Zorro. Uh, Mask of Zorro came out July 17, 1998, had a budget of $95 million, had a weekend opening of $22.52 million. It was number one its opening weekend, its only week at number one, and had a finished box office of $250.28 million, $94.09 million domestic, and $156.19 million international. Uh, now, for me... 1998, I only knew Antonio Banderas from one other film, and that was Desperado, which I love. I love Desperado so much. It is probably one of my favorite action films. And so seeing him come into play as Zorro, um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that he was going to be such a good Zorro in my eyes, which obviously it led to him becoming basically Puss in Boots, which is basically Cat Zorro. Uh, <laughs> but... I mean, look, am I wrong? No, no, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> He's totally Cat Zorro. That's probably why they cast him, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I I unabashedly love this film. I think Anthony Hopkins is awesome in this film as the original Zorro. I think Catherine Zeta-Jones, I think this might have been the first thing I ever saw her in personally, uh, is, is great in her role. Um, the two villains, who I always blank their names, 
um, Stuart Wilson and uh, um, oh my god, what is the name of the uh, the other dude, the guy in charge of the army? Yeah, the captain. Uh, captain Love. I don't think the actor is anybody notable. I thought he was Matt, Matt Lesher is his name. Matt Lesher. Yeah, Matt Lesher. Uh, I I enjoy the action of the film. I enjoy the humor of the film because even though it is an, an action film, they have great humor in this. I enjoy the uh, the basically the uh, soundtrack, which sounds basically something straight out of um, you know like a pirates film for the most part. Because it, it is isn't it Brockheimer? Uh, no, I don't think this is not Brockheimer. Is that Brockheimer? I thought it was a Brockheimer. It's because I, I remember I remember like this plane. I was like, oh, this sounds like pirates. It's Martin Campbell, but anyway, I I, I really enjoy this film. Um, Brian, I know you said you liked the film. I probably embellished by saying you loved it, but I know you like Mask of Zorro. No, uh, uh, first of all, this is Steven Spielberg produced, actually. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, I mean, well, he's probably executive producer, but there's a whole bunch of other people on it. Um, actually, though, I will say it's written by Terry Elliott and, uh, I'm sorry, Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, the writers of Pirates of the Caribbean. So there you go. Um, yeah, I, I love this movie. I, I, the only thing I, I didn't agree with what you said earlier was that you said we forgot about it. I never forgot about this movie. I love this movie. Well, I mean, may have if, forgot. You, if you ever say Zorro, my brain goes to this film, but I just don't think about Zorro. Like, barely oh, I, I, I do. If you because I, I when I think about like, like the even that just that year, that summer of movies, I remember this one all the time. If you talk about Antonio Banderas movies, this is gonna be one of the first three that jumps into my mind. Um, now. I had seen him in Desperado. I, I liked him in Assassins. I had seen him in uh, Interview the Vampire. He had a small role in. I think oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I him out before this. So I, I, I was aware of him. But so when they cast him, I'm like, you know what? That could be perfect casting. And Antonio is perfect casting for Zorro. I mean, because, yes, because he had definitely has a very a very debonair, debonair swashbuckling kind of kind of air to him that he fits the character of Zorro perfectly. But actually, my favorite scenes of his are – before he becomes Zorro, and he's, he's kind, kind of like, like an idiot. He's kind of bumbling idiot. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's, he's obviously he's got you know his he's got revenge on his mind and stuff. And it's it's the scenes with him and uh, Anthony Hopkins, especially like early on, like he's training him and stuff. Those are some of the most fun scenes in the entire movie. I love um, his first his first mission where he's fighting yeah. all the guys in, in the in the what was it like their quarters. Love yeah. that love that scene. Yeah, because the, the action set piece of this, what I really love about this is this kind of feels like old-fashioned filmmaking where every one of the action scenes, you feel like they built this big set and they're doing the action around the set. It's, there's no creative editing to it. There's no CGI effects or backgrounds. They built this set wherever they need to do it and they did the action there. And you're swinging from place to place and knocking down walls or whatever it is, it's actually happening. You can feel that. And that's, I think, what helps it because, I mean, obviously this is a throwback to like the old serial kind of movies and you totally feel that, but yet it is definitely modernized. Um, now, as much as Antonio Banderas is perfect casting for Zorro, the other casting is interesting to me because Anthony Hopkins as uh, the original Zorro and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Catherine Zeta-Jones, if you cast them in these roles today, the social justice Twitter would lose their shit. Because they'd be like, why can't you cast Hispanic actors? Antonio or Anthony Hopkins clearly no Hispanic in yeah, him. They just they just give him a really good tan. <laughs> he doesn't even try to use an accent in this movie. He's just Anthony Hopkins. I mean, it works. I had no problem with it, but it's, he wasn't even trying to act Spanish. I mean, he's about as Spanish as you know the Spaniard in uh, Gladiator. Um, and then you have Kathy Taylor Jones, who's Welsh, so she's from like you know England. And they make her, and she, I totally bought her. I mean, this is the first place I think I met her as well. I totally assumed she was some Spanish actress, and she did the part perfectly good. I thought I loved her in this role as well, as well as Anthony Hopkins. I'm just saying that if you made this movie today and cast those two, people would lose their shit. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things that really works as well is the chemistry between and Banderas and, and Hopkins for their roles but also the chemistry between Catherine Zeta-Jones and Antonio Banderas. The, the flirtatiousness, the all that stuff, I think, works beautifully between these two, whether it's from the first time they meet and they do the dance to their yeah. memorable sword fight in, in the horse. Their chemistry part. is off the charts. I mean, there, there's there's a very few movies where I look at it and I go, this is just perfect chemistry. The two of them together, first of all, they're two beautiful people. I mean, Antonio right. Banderas, I'm secure to say he's a sexy-looking man. He's a gorgeous <laughs> man. He is a gorgeous yeah. man. 
and Catherine Mary Jones as well, a beautiful woman. And the, the two of them, just it, it, whether it just be looks or dialogue, whatever, I, I think their chemistry is perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's it's one of those things where everything I think in this movie really just clicked in this film. I think I think the story clicks. I think the casting, give or take, obviously Hopkins and Catherine Zeta not being Spanish. I think the casting was perfect casting choices at the time. Uh, and I think even the villains, you have two villains uh, that are not necessarily big name villains, but I think they do a great job. Well, as Stuart Wilson villains. is one of those guys. He's the one of the guys, you know, I've seen that guy because he always plays a villain. He was a villain. I recognize him most from one of the lethal weapons. I think it was three. Um, I think he was also in The Rock, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he's one of those guys that shows up in villains in a lot of things. Actually, he was in Turtles 3. This will be his, uh, yeah, he's, he, yeah, he's in Turtles 3. He's in Turtles 3. Yeah. So, so yeah, he's, he's one of those guys who's just like, you know, he's standard, like, you know, he's going to be, the, if you see him in a movie, it's like that one guy we saw in Tears of the Sun. I was surprised to see him play a non-villainous role because he's, because this, this is one of those guys you've seen like, yep, he's going to be a villain. Well, he's not, he's not, he's not a villain in The Rock. He's, he's one of the like guys in the office kind of trying to run everything. Oh, is he? Okay. I, didn't yeah. like I assumed he was. Yeah, I, 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 literally, I literally just watched The Rock today. Okay. He's not a villain in The Rock. Um, but yeah, I think I think even the um, like I said, Stuart. Uh, I, I'm blanking on his name. Matthew. No, it was Matthew something. Um, the guy Matt, who plays uh, Matt Letcher. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Letcher. Well, I think I think he's more bigger on TV stuff. He was actually in 13 Hours. Apparently, I didn't recognize him, but okay. He was the politician guy. That's right. That was him. This guy who okay. uh, dies of smoke inhalation or something like that. I think he does a great job as Captain Love, and I love his scenes, especially that one scene with him and and Banderas in his office, and he's trying to get a rise out of him. That whole scene, I think, works great. I think even their final fight was done really, really well. Um, there's just so much I like about this film, and like like you said, I I 100 agree with you. This felt like a natural filming, meaning no green screens, no you know, CG or anything like that. It felt like they basically said, hey, we're going down to Mexico or, or Spain, wherever they shot it. We're going to find these places and we're going to shoot everything here and we're going to do all the stunt work and everything here, except for maybe the explosions. Everything is going to be authentic. Now, could we be 100% wrong on that? Absolutely. Because I'm pretty sure the, the sunset <laughs> when Banderas is walking. I'm sure there are things here and there. But I've been as far as most of the set pieces and the action yeah. scenes and the stunts it's were all... Real. It feels yeah. real. Uh, unlike where something like I Robot, where it's like okay, ninety percent of this film is, pro- is probably behind a green screen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I I just I love I love the action. I love how they choreographed the fights. How Zorro wasn't necessarily like unstoppable, like a Rambo. He was just clever with his surroundings. Like the one time where it's like he's getting rushed by like five dudes, and he just cuts the the big map so the map falls on them. It's like yeah. he just knows how to do certain things to basically get a, get away from everybody. And I, I just, I love the way this film was working. I, I even loved how it started where we got to see Anthony Hopkins as Zorro. So we mm-hmm. actually got to see him do it. Well, I'm sure most of that was probably a body double, but oh, still, <laughs> but still we got to see Anthony Hopkins as Zorro at first. And we got to see how the, the, the it lays the groundwork for the rest of the film. Yeah. And I, like you're saying with the, with the training sequences, I think that when they showed him in, in Zorro's lair, what do you want to call it, yeah. where, where he had like these things set up to, so he had to like swing around and use his surroundings. And you saw like, that's where he learned it, that it was more than just the pointy end goes in the other man, you know, it was, the end goes into the bank end. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so he, that, you can kind of see where, where he just didn't just suddenly become this great fighter. He learned to use his surroundings. And, and then to, to actually the have thing. like scenes later in the film, that come around to that to that rope stuff mm-hmm. like oh well, he, oh we did the rope thing he knows yep. that the only yep. thing I think they probably could have done a little bit more is use more of the whip because <laughs> I don't think a Banderas really uses the whip at all for the most part in the film. Now, the whip the whip's biggest moment is taking out candles apparently. <laughs> Still looks looks great and then and then his mask the first time was like I was, I'm surprised that didn't hurt <laughs> kind of thing but yeah I uh, Brian and I love this film this is such a great film I honestly don't remember the sequel that well. I don't remember it as well. I, it's it's one of those things where they had the kid grow up and they had a cutesy kid in it, and that took away a little bit from me. I still enjoy that movie a lot. Not just not as much as this one, but I yeah. do actually think it's a decent movie. I, I, honestly, I honestly just don't remember it. I think it's what the Legend of Zorro. It's Legend. Yes. Right? I yeah. don't remember the film at all. I don't. <laughs> it's it's shocking how much I love this one. And I don't remember the second one because probably because it just was like, eh, 
it, it is what it was. It wasn't that it was bad, but it wasn't memorable kind of thing. But yeah. um, Mask of Zorro, if you guys have never seen Antonio Banderas, basically playing the perfect role that got him Shrek, because let's face it, without this film, he never would have been Puss in Boots. Never. Ever, ever, I, ever. I hate to hear you say it that way, like it got him Shrek. Because I'm sorry, Shrek is a step down from Zorro. Just saying. Okay, talk. Well, let's let's look at his paycheck and see how what he got paid for. <laughs> Paycheck's a different story. Yeah. Let's be real here. But I mean, I I, I love Antonio Banderas. Like I said, Desperado to me is was probably my this and this and Desperado are probably my two favorite Antonio Banderas films of all time. I love both those films so much. But if you guys have never seen uh, The Mask of Zorro. Brian and I are basically telling you, go watch it now. Go watch Master Zorro. It is uh, free on Prime, 4K quality, free on Prime. Um, definitely check it out. You will not be disappointed uh, to see basically Antonio Banderas in probably one of his best roles, uh, personally, in my opinion. I think Brian would agree. In oh, that absolutely. Sense. It's, it's one. I mean, I love Desperado and Zorro. I think they're the, the two iconic Antonio Banderas roles. Yeah. But yeah, that uh, is a awesome. random side note again. Uh, Nick Chinland, we were just talking about. He's the guy that always plays a villain. He was in Tears of the Sun. He's a villain, Legend, Legend of Zorro. So there you go. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. But we are now moving on to my pick, which is the film that Brian had never seen, which is very, very hard to get Brian to see a movie that he's not seen because he, he, Brian sees everything. So it's very hard to pick something that Brian has had no, like, at all no no watching of the film but we are talking about a film we're going away from the action because i was we've been pretty action heavy now we're going to go to comedy and uh we're going to go to a film in the 90s uh it's 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 a it's a bros film that's the best way to say it. it's a bros kind of film and we are talking about 1999's the wood uh, not, uh the wood came out july 16th 1999 had a budget of six million dollars had a weekend opening of 8.5 million it was number six its opening weekend behind eyes wide shut in its first week american pie in its second week lake placid in its first week big daddy in its fourth week and wild wild west in its third week and had an ex uh, finished box office of 25.05 million um this is a film i i i, I really enjoy this film it's one of those that I think I caught it on TV one night. Like I didn't watch it when it first came out. Um, and it was one of those movies where it's like, you're just flipping through the channels, you know, back then when you didn't have like streaming and you know, you had like a thousand things to watch. I was like, I think I was just going through the channels and I stopped on a scene in this movie. I'm pretty sure it was the, the scene in the playground or, or during recess scene. You know, the scene I'm talking about. And I just, God, kind of just got sucked into this film and I grew to love this movie and its cast. Um, I love the, just the interplay between the three leads as they were older to the three leads when they were younger. Uh, Omar Epps, Tay Diggs, and uh, it's Richard T. Jones, right? Yeah, Richard mm -hmm. T. Jones. And then the three young leads, uh, Sean Nelson, Dwayne Finley, and Trent Cameron. Um, it, it, it's just a bro film. It's about, you know, these, these, these uh, guys, uh, one of them is getting married and they're obviously, he's got the two best men and they're trying to get him basically down the aisle because he's disappeared. And they just keep reminiscing about when they first met each other um, back when uh, Mike uh, played by Omar Epps um, had just moved in. And it's just about their, their accolades of that first year of being friends to where they are today and kind of learning, learning to that it's, you know, as you become friends and you get older, things change. You have to grow and be able to be okay with things changing. And uh, I, I unabashedly also love this film. I love the cast. I love the way it's done. This was the first time watched for Brian. So, Brian, what were your thoughts on The Wood? Um, the Wood, um, brought to you by Pepsi. Um <laughs> <laughs> what was the other? What was the other one? You said, "Oh yeah, Heineken, uh, Heineken." Heineken. Uh, yeah, Brian, Brian had a sponsorship kick during this. I just kept unabashedly pointing oh, no. out. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna get this out of the way here. early. I was gonna say out of the way early since I mentioned <laughs> it. Um, the movies have product placement. It's just a common thing. It's like, hey, if you're gonna have a car, use our car. We'll pay you some money. Things like that. There's some movies. SWAT is one of the worst ever offenders. If you ever watch that movie, but I this one's like Power Rangers is the worst with Krispy Kreme. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's, I think they actually put it into a, a plot point. But this is one of those movies where, like, any scene that was anywhere near a convenience store 
or a, a uh, in a restaurant or pizzeria. Things like that. There's always a big Pepsi sign somewhere, sometimes multiple Pepsi signs. Any product you saw on the shelves was was Pepsi, made sure it wasn't any Coke. Any time drinking something, like made sure to home diet Pepsi, you know. Anyway, that was just something I just enjoyed watching for. It was like playing, you know, where's Waldo? Spot the Pepsi in here. Anyway, that's a whole separate thing. Uh, as far as overall feelings of the movie, um, I knew zero of anything going into this movie. I, I found out it's directed by Rick Famuyiwa, whatever, who I know did some Mandalorian episodes. Yeah. Uh, he also did Dope, which I actually really enjoyed. So I, I, when I found that out, I was even more intrigued by this movie. Um, it was okay. Um, I think overall my feelings are that I enjoyed the young kids storyline. I feel like the older, uh, the adult storyline was almost completely unnecessary. It's like, it's there basically just to say, hey, remember this? And then they dissolve into a flashback to a scene with the kids, which I mean, I I, I get what they're going for. It just feels unnecessary. It's almost like they had this cool coming of age story and said, well, wait, they want to make this R-rated movie. It's coming of age story, but no, we, we, we need some adults because adults aren't going to go watch a kid's story. So they said, let's put in this adult storyline and put in some names, Omar Epps. And I, I mean, Tate was only a name at the time, but I didn't dislike those scenes. I just felt like they were necessary and I kept wanting to get back to the other scenes most of the time, especially because Tay Diggs spends half the time doing the worst drunk acting you've ever seen. Well, not the worst, doing some pretty bad drunk acting. I won't say the worst. Um, but I mean, for the most part, I, I, I enjoyed the film. Like I said, I just enjoyed the kids stuff better. Uh, I do think that it definitely shows as his first feature because there's the editing's really kind of choppy. Some of the, it doesn't really flow very well sometimes when it goes from scene to scene. But these are, those are nitpicks. It was fine. I didn't hate it, didn't love it. I mean, the, the grown up parts is once again showing the growth of the friendship and showing what happens when you grow up with friends that you've had for so long and how things change when you're adults. I get and I'm, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to say that you didn't get it because you do get it. But I agree. The the younger scenes are the more um, entertaining because you don't know what's going to happen when, when, mm -hmm. when they were kids and us you know, living back then to with those kind of you know teenage years when we see those things happening we were gonna choke because like oh we've we, we've been there we've seen that happen for all oh, we know where this might be going kind of thing but um but yeah i would i would agree that the the younger uh actors scenes are the more entertaining and they're the ones you focus on to the point when you do get to the older scenes i think they still serve their purpose and i think they're still important to the story but yes you do want to get back to the younger versions of I themselves suppose maybe i could i would have like, like to see maybe just less of them like obviously the beginning and the ending maybe pop up once in the middle but it was just constant i thought it was unnecessary that's just me you have to you have to go back to them at some point it's like you have to i uh, think it would have been fine if it's if they had the beginning and they kind of flash back to their kids and then you see them at the end i think would have worked i, I, I think we need to back to them every time to be like hey remember that time let's go <laughs> I, I would say that it's about 60 40 in favor of the kids over the adults in terms of the film, which I think. Exactly. I think, it should have been more like 80 20. I, I disagree with that in your heart. But I'm going to take this as a win that you actually <laughs> liked it. Um, because. It was no rock and roll, to say that. Well, it was no ravishing or uh, ravenous or uh, vanishing or, yeah. So I'm going to take this You're as right, a win. You're right. Those are better movies than this. I'm going to take this as a win because. Very, very rarely do I get Brian to watch a movie that he has not seen that he actually ends up liking. Because I was watching Brian while watching this movie, and he was attentive to it. And he was enjoying it, even though he was pointing out Pepsi and Heineken the whole time, which was annoying <laughs> the hell out of him. He's like, dude, stop focusing on the fucking sponsors and watch the movie. Um, which so the point where at the, at the end, at the wedding at the end, I was like, hey, you know what they're probably drinking at this wedding? Pepsi and Heineken. <laughs> Transformers is the worst in terms of product Yes, yes. That. But... Anyway, The Wood, um, like I said, if you're looking for a comedy uh, just about friendship and like I said, it's a, bro, it's a bros film. Uh, I mean, we, we, we get those movies a ton with, with you know, girls and girlfriends and, you know, they grow up and stuff like that. We don't get a whole lot of, in terms, like bros films. Like we, we get films like, uh, like it was like Hangover where they're all kind of like they're buddies, but they're not like bros. In this, they, they've been friends for, was like 13 years or something like that. So, I mean, you've had this growing 
relationship between the characters. I think it's all done really, really well. And I think if you guys um, want to see a movie like that, then The Wood is definitely something worth checking out. Uh, the Wood, I don't believe it's on anything for free nope. right now. Uh, but I mean, obviously, you can rent it on Amazon Prime for like three bucks. Uh, I think it's I think it's worth a three dollar purchase. I think. Especially for Omar Epps, who we don't really get to see a whole lot of anymore. Tay Diggs with hair, which was also weird. Kind of, but yeah, Tay Diggs with hair is weird. Um, and then Richard T. Jones, for anyone who watches the TV show The Rookie, uh, he plays the captain on that show. If you want to see him in more of a comical role, uh, Richard T. Jones, I think, does a, uh, a funny job as Slim. So be uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, it's definitely something I, I would definitely worth checking out. And like I said, Brian says he liked it. He didn't love it, but he liked it. So I'm going to take that as a win. Uh, but we are now going to our featured film. Uh, we're book. We started with Will Smith. We're going to finish with Will Smith. This is a movie that Brian and I get a lot of shit for loving um, from a lot of our community people. And we, yeah, we don't get the flying fuck. We love this film. We quote this film. We talk about this movie a lot. We throw it in other people's faces how much we love this movie. We get that it's not the best movie ever. We get that it's not technically a good film in terms of what the whole thing is, but we love this movie and we don't give a shit if you don't like it because we fucking love it. And that is Bad Boys 2. Bad Boys 2 came out July 18th, 2003, had a budget of $130 million, had a weekend opening of $46.52 million, number one its opening weekend, its only week at number one, finished box office at $273.33 million, $138.6 million domestic, and $134.7 million international. Um, yeah, it's Bad Boys. I mean, come on. How can how how can we not talk about bad boys at some point? Now, I am one of the I I think Brian's with me is a lot of people tend to to like Bad Boys One better than Bad Boys Two because it's a more complete film. I disagree. I love Bad Boys Two. Bad Boys Two to me was Fast and the Furious before Fast and the Furious fucking started. I think Bad Boys Two was the bench point to show Fast and the Furious could do what they wanted to do. Uh, granted that, you know, Fast and Furious, I think, was the first one was only out at that time. I think Bad Boys 2 is is the start of the downfall of Michael Bay. It's the start of the downfall. Because to me, it was the last good Michael Bay film. So well, no, I don't know if I can go that far. Hold on, hold on. I like Pain and Game. I like Pain and Game. But this is when you start to notice some of the Michael Bay-isms. And that's where, but it works because... You got Will Smith and, and Martin Lawrence. Yeah, Michael Bay's uh, Michael Bay gets a lot of crap, especially his early films. Like a lot of people like The Rock and the first Bad Boys and stuff. They're, they're, they got plenty of action. They definitely have the Michael Bay style. You could already see to them, but they're, they're, I actually really like that about them. I think Bad Boys Two is where he tipped into excess. This is this oh, is the oh. first, this is the movie where where he started going into just more of everything. I want. I don't want you know. A couple of cars chasing the free. I want hundreds of cars crash all over the place. I want explosions here. I want fifty thousand gunfights in the movie. It's just going and and obviously after this, when he went into like Transformers and that, he went all into excess. This one definitely tipped into excess, but I still enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah, I mean, is it is it one car chase scene too many? Yes. Um, I I do think the the uh, the casket car chase is probably unnecessary. It oh, I love the gas guitar chase. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, in terms of the movie as a whole, if there was something you could take out to maybe tighten it, it's probably that chase scene. I That's will tell you, you could remove. I will tell you what you can take out of this movie is the whole ending section when they go to Cuba. That's I the end that, of the fucking film. <laughs> I think the movie essentially could have ended when they, you know, were at his mansion and the, the whole thing. Oh, not, I'm not going to going down all the houses and, and, and to Guantanamo Bay. You mean that? Yeah, that whole section. Yeah, okay, got, the, okay, whole, okay. the whole Guantanamo Bay section with that, with the minefield and all that stuff. It just felt superfluous. It's like I think it should have ended, you know, earlier. And then that whole section was, which there's many reasons why I didn't really enjoy the minefield section. But I, I think that the, you could have cut out like 15, 20 minutes right there. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, I honestly didn't feel like it was car chase too many. I I was there for all the action, and yes, it was. Well, okay. technically, technically, it is a car chase too many if you want to remove that one part because <laughs> that's removing a car chase. So technically, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I know. Um, but but I mean, I, I 
yes, it was a ton of action. And yes, I can see how some people are going to be like, you know, okay, this is overkill. This is too much. But but I was there for it. I, I enjoyed every one of the action scenes. Um, obviously, the, inner, the, the main thing of the movie is the, uh, the chemistry between the two, you know, between oh. Marcus and Mike, oh. which as good as ever. I, I, I will still say I think I enjoy the first film better. Oh, but it's but it's not a matter of it's like you know they're neck and neck i think much. i think in terms of the first film i think the i think it drags going into the third act and i love bad boys i do but if i'm going back and watching it i tend to get bored when we're doing the interplay of where Tay Leone can't tell which one's Mike and which one's marcus we have the whole like teasing where he thinks that he's cheating on his wife and it's just like like it's it's just like that's the part where I'm just like okay come on come on come on Bad Boys Two is just excessive action and comedy all the way through that it just you, there's there's no real time for breathing which normally is bad but I think with with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence at the helm of it I think it works uh, we got we got a small small cameo of um, Michael Shannon before he was anything in this okay. film. I have my rights. Which I actually like Michael Shannon. He pops up in like more comedic roles like this instead of him oh, always yeah. being like trying to be intimidating. He was yes. he was a lot of fun in this. Yeah. I think even Mike even Michael Bay's got a small scene in this film. He does um, as the, I guess if he gets carjacked. No, no, he doesn't get carjacked. He just He almost gets carjacked. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and then he just drives away calling uh, Marcus a freak. 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 <laughs> obviously fantastic acting by Michael Bay. Um I, probably one of my favorite uh, moments between uh, Marcus and and uh, Mike, and it's not the one scene that I think we're all talking about. Yeah. It's it's right after the opening scene with the KKK, uh, where um, uh, Marcus got shot in the ass by Mike, and and he goes, "I got shot in the ass. Who shot you in the ass? Like just like Will Smith's back and forth. You did. No, I shot you." I mean, I did a lot of shooting, but someone shot you in the ass. <laughs> I just, I love that. Just like Will Smith kills me in that scene. And it's like, I love, just, I love these two together. I, the third film, I think kind of fell apart for me by the end of the movie. It, it didn't hit the same notes that I think two does or even one does. It, it, to me, it's the weakest of the three, but I was so happy to see them come back together. But with two, we got, there's so many set pieces. I mean, you've got the obviously one that everyone I think remembers, which is the uh, the first date scene, which is iconic for Bad Boys Two. Um, mm -hmm. You've got the the morgue, which to me with, with Martin uh, or Marcus on X, Mike, Mike, take the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I love that scene so much. Uh, there's just so much of this film that, like, I actually think um, it obviously we're not we're not going to leave out uh, Peter Stromer. I love Peter Schomer in this film. Oh, yeah, the supporting cast. I mean, Joey oh, Pants yeah. is always great. Joey yeah, Pants is Joey awesome. Pants is great. Gabrielle Union is solid in the film as well. Peter Stromer. Um, and oh. then, I mean, besides, I mean, just every, like, you have Henry Rollins pops up in here. You know what? Yeah. And uh, one of the like, SWAT guys. Uh, John Spider Sally, former Chicago Bull. He comes back as, uh, what's he name called? Spider he's, he's in, he's in um, the TV series, LA's Fortress. Finest. Which is oh, is he? is he? I didn't know. Yeah, I haven't watched that yet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's he's got like me, he he pops up at least once or. Once oh, nice! Or I got to start watching that. Then. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the first two seasons is on Netflix. It had it had a third season and before it got canceled. Um, but also I didn't hate Jordy Mol Mol is it Molia, Mol Molly, the the bad guy. Oh, I don't um, know how to pronounce his name. Yeah, I he's yeah. one of those guys who Molly I look at his filmography and I've seen a ton of movies he's in. I don't remember him in any of them. <laughs> Yeah, I don't either, but I he's so over the top, but I like it as well. Like there's the one part where he 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 shoots his cousin and his, and his mom's like, Oh, what happened? Oh, he killed himself. Okay, bye. <laughs> he's like waving the gun around the whole time, too. <laughs> like it's that just, and I love the, I love when he's talking about the rats eating his money. He's like, This is a stupid problem to have, but it is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> they eat my money before they get to Cuba. <laughs> you know, or or when he's uh when he's uh, talking about the painting. To the, to the to the gay painter who obviously it's Michael Bay so he's over the top flamboyant gay but he's like I just want the little angels looking down on me <laughs> it's like this is depressing <laughs> and then like even honestly and here's the one part too that I loved it's and you don't see it a whole lot in films and I think I actually really love this moment is at, in the final scene 
when they're when they're attacking his house and everything, and his house gets blown up. You see him like freaking out that his house is getting blown up. You never see a, a, a bad guy freak out like that. Yeah, because because the house, the house he's been living in is actually his mom's house. It's all run down, pile of shit, yeah. confessed with rats, all that kind of thing. And he keeps making a big deal about I'm having my new house in Cuba. Everything brand new is going to be awesome. Oh, and then yeah. they get down there and blow it up. <laughs> and then he's like, oh my, oh my god! Like we never get to see a, like the main bad guy freak out about something happening at their personal possessions like that. I Which, lo- it's, it's a small moment, but I loved it. Which leads to one of my one of my favorite lines towards the end is when Will Smith's like, exactly hey, let's just all go home and cool off. Well, we'll go home. You can find a hotel. You go to a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just pick this up on another day. There's so many great lines in this movie. The, act, the very, very first chase scene uh, where they're dropping the cars and so I think is done to perf- – that, that is peak Michael Bay. That's that done Michael so Bay. well. If, if you look, at, you go look on YouTube, you'll find recycled footage. Uh, Michael Bay reuses a lot of his action films. You can find pieces of Bad Boys Two in the island. There are pieces of Bad yep. Boys Two chase scenes in Transformers. Transformers. They just like they like basically just CGI like a, a robot into the scene and stuff. So if you, if you look for it on YouTube, you'll find it. It's kind of funny. You want to see the original scene? Yeah, it's Bad Boys Two. Why they reuse it? It's so well done. That's what I'm and saying. Because it's, it's so great, and there's yeah. so many great moments. Like uh, what was it the when the car flips? It's like that Oh, that puck that puck in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the um the scene where they're fighting the the um oh uh, the, the Haitians in the house. Mm-hmm. Who in my house? The devil. Why you gotta say the devil in his house? Shit! <laughs> it just there's so many great moments of this film. I I just we could talk about this movie for for a whole hour. I I love this film. I think Will Smith and Martin Lawrence are having the best time possible there is one really really bad edited scene that irks me every time i see it it's at the very very end when uh they're both in the pool and the pool breaks Mm -hmm. and you can see that it's two stunt doubles coming out of the pool into the water it's like really martin lawrence and will smith were not okay to do that scene because like you can see that like that is 100 percent not will smith (laughs) but i love this movie I love this movie so much. It's I so. Say, if I had to pick one moment that I didn't like in this movie, it's it's in the Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo. Guantanamo I, that, I, want, I want to say I know exactly where you're going to go with because I also don't like it, but I want to see if I'm right. Uh, when Gabriel, when they say put your gun down, and Gabrielle Union's like, okay, I'm going to throw this right at your feet, right onto the mine, and she throws the gun. Like, 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 like why would she yell that to the guy? Like, oh, just so you know, I'm going to throw it on that mine next to you. Like, okay, I thought it might have been. It's the same moment, but you're you're focusing on the one part that I'm not focused on. I was focusing on Martin Lawrence going the unnecessary barrel roll. And then, and no, 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 because because right when the gun, you see him go, and then he stops because that's as far as he's going in the scene. And then the next shot is the actual barrel roll. So like, if you if you're not watching the gun, if you look behind the gun, you see Martin. Martin like does this and then stops. Yeah, because the whole thing because, because like she, she says that unnecessarily, like to warn the bad guy she's thrown at the mine. And then Martin Lawrence, first of all, his character Marcus doesn't need to roll or anything at all. He's because he's he rolled to shoot somebody, but he still had the gun in his hand already. So it's like he had no reason to barrel roll, much less in the like, minefield. Almost lands on the mind. <laughs> yeah, much less in the minefield. But yeah, I didn't. I actually honestly didn't notice the bad edit. Yeah, he, like, he basically uh, he basically does this motion and then stops. <laughs> and it's like, and it's because he's not going to actually do the role. Right. But it's there are there are things to poke at. We get it. There is some cringy dialogue. We get it. But we both love this film. Uh, we've taken a lot of shit for loving this film, but we don't care. Part of the no. reason we get the Weird Crusaders is because Brian and I do like some of the same movies like this, and we both and we don't care what people say. And this is one of those movies. Like when we came to this week, and we both saw Bad Boys Two, we're like. We're not not talking about this, right? <laughs> like, we if we don't talk about this, like, what's the fucking point of the show? Right. If we're not gonna talk about Bad Boys too, <laughs> and then it just but like, right there. And then I got that point was like, well, we got iRobot, we got Mask of Zorro. This is a good week, but we, we Bad Boys Two is hundred percent the feature. Like, we're not removing this. But it's also uh, second movie for um, Olg 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 Olden Olgen the his, uh. Peter Stromer's uh, buddy, because he was in Predators. He was the Russian in Predators. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that the guy they end up cutting up and putting in a uh, tortilla thing. Um, blank, I'm blanking on his actual name. I'm not seeing it, but yeah, that's that's the same guy from Predators. So that's his second film on the Weekend Crusaders so far. Uh, but yes, uh, Bad Boys Two. 
it's not on any streaming services right now, but mm-hmm. obviously it's worth a rental. Clearly, if you've never seen any of the Bad Boys films, watch the first one before you see this one. So that way you have the relationship of Marcus and Mike Lowry. Uh, now, Mike Lowry. Uh, you got to have their, their that first film of their relationship together. So that way when they go right into two. And also, I don't know how many times at work, once again, because of how much I love this film, every time I'm stressed out at work, Woosa. <laughs> just <laughs> Woosa. Which, by the way, does not work. No, it does not work. It doesn't work. Just like Goose Fraba from Anger Management does not work. Um, damn, the Wolves off, Captain. Did you just call me a tick? <laughs> just, uh, there's there's so many great lines. This I love this movie so damn much. Um, also, the rats. <laughs> they fuck just like us. I was wondering you were going to say it. <laughs> they yeah, I mean, a <laughs> Why? How is that helping me do my job? <laughs> anyway, guys, um, definitely watch Bad Boys. Uh, obviously, watch the first one. It's it's still it's a really good action film. So you still got the comedy. It's just not to the tenth degree that Bad Boys Two is. But Bad Boys Two is I, I love Bad Boys Two so much. Um, the funeral with the, with the with the whole funeral home scene is is great as well. Uh, we can just like I said, we can keep going. Anyway, that's our episode, guys. We hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Weekend Crusaders. If you guys did, go ahead and hit that like, share, and subscribe button to the channel so you guys see up to date with all the latest videos that pop up on the Movie Crusaders. And of course, don't forget to follow us on all the social media outlets you see below. Uh, coming up next, we have reviews for Space Jam: The New Legacy and Part Three of Fear Street. Uh, I think it's 1666. 1666? Wow, that's old. Yeah, 1666. Uh, 19, isn't it 1966? No, it's 1666. Oh, is it 1600s? Okay. Yeah, part part one is. I haven't watched it yet. I don't know. Part part one's 94. Part two is 78, and part three is 1666. Oh. Um, it's supposed to be like which is <laughs> um. So be on the lookout for those two reviews. Is there? I want to say there's another movie. Gunpowder. Oh, yeah. Uh, Escape room. This is just a tournament of champions kind of movie. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get that watch because I have to go to the theater to watch it. I just don't know if it's worth Gunpowder Milkshake. It's not. Oh, yes. Gunpowder Milkshake on Netflix. We are 100% going to have a review for Gunpowder Milkshake uh, because I am a huge Carrie, Karen Gillum fan as well as everyone else in that film. So we got a few reviews popping out. So be on the lookout for those. And then, of course, we'll be back again with um, another episode of The Weekend Crusaders next week. Uh, it's an all action film uh, episode. We have. Um, probably a action film from the 90s that has one iconic line that has been said way, way too many times. We have an action comedy sequel that I remember the sequel more than I remember the original. Uh, we have a uh, an action film, an underrated action film that I think is well-liked by everyone, but also kind of forgotten by a lot of people as well. We have probably one of the greatest at army films or war films ever made as at least the first 20 minutes of which that should have been the dead indicator of what the hell that movie was right there and then we've got a stinker that i have never seen i know it's awful there's no way this is going to be good brian let's is- just say sean we already know doesn't like a previous film in the franchise He's really gonna like considered the best in the franchise and now i have to watch the worst in the franchise <laughs> This is going to be bad. It's, it, it's going to be really, really bad. Um, so figure out what those movies are. And until next time, I'm Sean Wasserkrupp. That's Brian Michaels. We are the Weekend Crusaders. And until next time, in case we don't see you, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, movie Crusaders. You still here? It's over. Go home.